All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of the CH Chronicles podcast. Super excited. Uh, today, we have Lisa Marie Fortier joining us from Engine. Lisa, say hello to the CX Nation. Hey, everybody. <laughs> nice to be here with you, Adrian. <laughs> so we're, we're excited to have you. And obviously, you and I were just laughing and joking around before, before diving into this today. But guys, Lisa Marie has a super cool story. She's working at an awesome business. Um, that's not just not just working with with with, with a small set of customers, but a, a big set of customers that um, are constantly thinking about different ways that you can expand your customer experience, your customer success, product experience, all these awesome things. So I'm excited for today's chat. Lisa Marie, why don't yeah, you just me. start off the show? Give set the stage for the listeners. Give us a sense for who you are and how you got into this whole world and and how you landed uh, in this in this awesome position that you're in today at Engine. Well, I get to tell you, it's been a little bit of a weird ride, um, but one that I've loved, absolutely loved. I was actually going to go to law school and I uh, was kind of headed out the door there. And I had, I was working at an aid agency at the time. And I had a really important mentor of mine say, you know what, this might be a cool place for you to live. Would you think about moving over to my strat planning team where we think all about how do we connect, you know, grow great brands that consumers will love. And I was like, huh not law school, but let's give it a shot. <laughs> so I, uh, I put my law school plans on hold and uh, I'm not a lawyer right now. So I never went back. I stayed here and I spent some time on the advertising side, really getting to understand brand. You know, there's no better place to understand brand, I think, than at an agency, right? Absolutely. It's what they do all day long. And they do it for so many different companies that you really get to see how that comes to life in just all sorts of places. And then I went to the client side so I could kind of see the other side of the fence. How do you just day in, day out, focus on one brand and one set of customers, right? And then now I've spent the latter part of my career um, working here at Engine Insights and working on the vendor side where, you know, my job is to help those brands understand their consumers across a variety of areas. And that's what I've been doing. Um, my role here at Engine, as you and I were chatting about, recently changed. Um, up until the past couple of years, I was really focused on helping our organization really grow the business. Um, I don't know if your your uh, your group of folks here understands who Engine is, but a little bit of background on them. We we stemmed from ORC International, which is a name that a lot of people will have known. It was a really long-standing research company, really good depth in being able to do research. And then we've come together as a, as a part of Engine, which is a broader organization. It's really much more of a marketing organization. We have all sorts of different capabilities there. And I work within the Insights Division, and that's where I'm at. And so now we're kind of this new company, right? So we're dealing with a lot of the issues that like your newer companies, even though all of our parts have been around a while, we're, we've come to market now in the past few years in a really new and exciting way which means we're doing a lot of sales and there's a lot of focus on growing the business and really getting that name out there, which we do a great job at. But now I'm in a role where it's like, you know what, we've got to start pivoting and taking care of those customers. The people that are deciding to partner with us, you know, I think a lot of companies really focus on sales, on growth, on that revenue number. That's what the investors want. That's what the owners want. Let's face it. Everybody loves that. But you know, there's this, I think sometimes it gets overlooked that you got to pay attention to your customers too. Yeah. Otherwise you wind up with a lot of that, you know, they're in the door and out the door and that's no good. 100%. Either. Yep. As you and I were just joking about before, before jumping into today's show, it's so common for every business in every industry in every space to yeah. constantly be chasing the next deal, the next badge, the next logo, the next account. And I get it. It's fun. Like that's definitely one of the fun parts of growing a business, running a business, yeah. building a business, yeah. being a part of a sales team. But you just nailed it, Lisa Marie. It's like at the end of the day, you need to be able to retain the customers that you bring on board, right? You need to be able to keep them with you for the long haul. You have to expand their lifetime value. You need to constantly be listening and learning to them for what other things you could potentially help them with, right? Because theoretically, if you're really good at listening and retaining over time, you start to find out you start with maybe pro um, uh, providing one product or maybe a couple of services. And before you know it, you're doing a ton of different things for these clients because you learn this stuff over time. And retention and customer experience and success is frankly where a lot of companies are investing to get those insights and to get some of that information so that they can grow their business into the future. So I love it. Um, one, one quick question for you um, that you just right out of the gates. Um, you mentioned something really interesting. You know, working in a business that's focused on marketing you guys see a ton of different strategies. You see a ton yeah. of different businesses. 
you see a lot of different teams and tools and processes and feedbacks. You do get a really good, almost like this, um, this inside look at all the different things that are working really, really well for companies. So that must be like um, almost like a little part of the magic sauce to, to, how, to building some of the CX and the CS that you guys were thinking about at Engine Insights, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you learn and then you learn what's working, who's doing it well and how, how that translates to overall success. And you also get to see, wow, who's not doing it so well. And that's where we, <laughs> yeah, can, yeah. you know, we try to come in and help advise there and say, you know, you might have some opportunities here, some opportunities there. You know, we see a lot of organizations, for example, that are really busy chasing numbers even on the CX side, like they're chasing that MPS score, or they're chasing an OSAT yep. score, or they're chasing a number of sorts, some sort without a true understanding of what does that mean to the organization? So what? Yeah. You get that yeah. number. So what? What does that actually really mean? And again, they tend to correlate it back to sales. And it's like, well, it, it doesn't, it doesn't always mean that sometimes because some, you know, some of our customers, they, they aren't always going to show their appreciation by awarding you another project right away either. And yep. so, you know, one of the things to kind of keep in mind there is this is a long game sometimes. And I, and I know the folks that love that revenue number don't love to hear that. They, they like <laughs> it to move a little more quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's keeping in mind that even when you're doing a really great thing and you get a great, you know, five star rating or a really high NPS score is that that doesn't mean necessarily there'll be more money coming in tomorrow. But you still want to continue to deliver like that because you're building that relationship and you're building so that when the next thing comes that they need you, hopefully you become one of the companies they turn to or maybe the only company you turn to but it is more of a relationship i I've, I've gotten to the point these days where i really like to think about the customers and and i think the companies that do this really well do too think about them the same way you think about your personal relationships customers aren't aliens from another planet they aren't we don't we don't suddenly go into a completely different mindset when we're a consumer versus the way we are as humans in general and just remembering that that's who we are we're humans and there's ways that relationships work well, and there's ways that they don't. 100%. Yep. And, and that tends to stand whether you're a brand or whether you're the neighbor across the street. If you want yeah. a good relationship, there's certain things that you just do and certain things you don't. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You're right. It's funny. It's like so sometimes, you know, especially with some of the work that we do at CXC, where we're, where we're helping some of these growth focused companies, and we'll get into like the idea inside of our working sessions of customer portfolio reviews or customer portfolio management. And some of the questions might be, all right, let's talk about when's the last time we've talked with some of these customers? Well, we haven't talked with them in 60, 90, 180 days. And okay, fine. But to your point, Lisa Marie, it's like, well, wait a minute, your best friends or your mom and dad or <laughs> right. your kids or your wife, your husband, like, you talk to these people constantly. Now, I'm not saying like you got to figure out your your, your appropriate cadence, and you got to uh, yeah. you got to figure out what your industry's tolerance is for that level of, of right. regular touch points of communication. But like customers are the same type of way. Like if if you're not talking to somebody for 180 days, why would you expect that you're going to get another renewal contract? Whereas right. if you know what's going on with their business, you know what's going on with their team, you know that they just changed into a big exciting new role, and like you you're talking about it, you know what's going on those are the types of game changers that make such a big difference. And then frankly, for, for many of the, the listeners on the show, Lisa Marie, you know, if you really want to be um, a customer focused business leader of the future, these are the types of things that you got to start getting good at doing, or that you got to start getting really good at doing with your team, right? It's leading the charge, showing the way, giving examples, coaching and supporting how they can do it really well with their portfolios. That's the game changing stuff. Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you definitely need to, I mean, a lot of, you know, what we at Engine, a lot of what starts well is that you got to you got to walk the walk and talk yeah. and talk in the whole nine yards. And that's where part of my remit now is I, I lead, like we have a client centricity committee. We have become focused in the past 18 months that we can't very well advise others what to do if we're not doing it ourselves. And so again, kind of understanding that, yep, sales is great. Growth is wonderful. Yep. Nobody in business doesn't like those things. And that's, that's the thing we're striving for every company each year, you push a little more and you push a little more, but we yep. realize that part of the way to get there isn't just by having an awesome sales team, which I think we do, but, and that's great, but it's also in making sure the folks that hang out with the customers the most, really understand, but that we, that we do that from the inside out, that we just have to be very focused on the clients in order for us to do our best work as well, as opposed to just telling our clients to go focus on their clients. Yep. Totally. You know, we've got to do more. the same thing. 
You have to. Yep, you're right. It's a bad. It's a, it's a give and a take and a back and a forth. Lisa Maria, I'd love for you to jump into the first CX pillar of team. So you've already started to kind of scratch the surface, and, and you've talked yeah. about some of the different functions and some of the different teams and areas and departments at, at Engine Insights. But give us a, give, give the listeners an idea for sort of who the team is, um, how you've sort of kind of laid out the players on the pitch, and some of the different focus areas that that that, that the awesome people at Engine are are really kind of going to work every single solitary day focused on. Yeah. Well, one of the great things about the timing of this little discussion is, as I mentioned to you earlier, I've jumped into a new role here. And so I'm like, what did I tell you, 32 days in or 31 yeah, brand days new. in? Brand new. <laughs> brand new into this role and super yeah. excited. And and so you're hitting me at a good time because I'm asking all these questions right now. So of course I got a team, you know, we didn't just let everybody go and hire new. You don't do that. <laughs> so we've got a group of people here. And so part of my job is to say, you know, let's take a look at what people do. What are they passionate about? What do they want to do? What are things that they don't want to do or maybe just aren't well equipped to do? And let's make sure we've got the people in the right places, both in terms of skill set, but also in terms of passion. Yep. I think passion makes a big differentiator. Again, when it comes down to relationships and how you treat your clients, let's get the people in the right places. And that might mean a little bit of some shift. So right now, the first thing I'm doing is let's get to know all the players. Let's get to know what needs to be done and who really wants to do what, and who really can do what. I think where you really run into problems is when you do the proverbial, take a round peg, shove it in a square hole kind of thing and just hope it's yep. going to work. It doesn't. Nine yep. times out of 10, that doesn't work without a heck of a lot of pressure coming down on that round peg that you're trying to yeah. push into that you know that square hole and and so what I'm trying to do right now is say okay let's get the lay of the land and let's find out and then let's get clear on what's really important what are the things that we really need to be good at right and then like I say let's make sure that we've got that shored up you know maybe at the end of this what we'll find out is huh we've got a gap over here we need to bring yep. a few more people in over there but I want to make sure that we also let the employees do what allows them to shine because as again, it starts, it starts internally. If you got a bunch of people that are getting up and going to work and to the point that you said, you know, what are we, what is everybody doing every day? Hopefully something they love and that they're passionate about. Hopefully something that feels less like a job and, and more like something that they really enjoy. And that's kind of what the, because that will translate out to the, to the customers, right? Big they're going to feel Big that. Time. Yep. And so yeah. I want to make sure people are there that not only can answer the questions and do the work and execute well, but who want to, and who'll take that time to do that little bit of extra and make sure that they're not, you know, that they're communicating more frequently than once a year and things like that, because they really want to be in the role that they're in. I think it's just so important. I love, I love that you're starting with this because it's, it's just like, I, I I hate to always go to sports analogies, but they just they, in this specific case they work, which is <laughs> they like, do work. <laughs> they do, they really do. But like it's they like do. your point is so spot on. Where it's like if if you want to be a world class per, you know performer or, or championship team, like you wouldn't have the best pe- the best guys and gals that are that are, that are your defense people playing offense, right? And vice versa, you wouldn't have the best goal scorers or the best offensive players, the best dribblers, the best shooters, the best scorers. You wouldn't have those people playing goalie and, and, and defense. You literally need to have the right folks in the right place at the right time, right? And that and part of that allows people to just, number one, I think, thrive like in their natural lanes and in their natural environment. Yep. Some people are just really good in specific tranches of a business or specific areas of the day-to-day business operations, or some people love talking to customers and they can do it all damn day. Other customers or other employees get terrified by that idea, but they could be the best supportive behind the scenes cast and crew for the customer focus people. And so you're right. It's like really taking some time to do that audit or do that assessment and really making sure that you got the right people in the right places. It's, it's huge. The the, the last part of the summary that that I love about this point is just like, you're already talking about how critical like employee experience team and culture is to sound CX. Like you so can't, much. you can't, you can't separate. Thing. You cannot separate. They're completely related. And I, and I love that so many folks that come on the show, they almost call it out immediately. And it's obviously because of the space that we're in and what we're doing for our different businesses, but right. they do go hand in hand and companies and future customer focused business leaders really do need to be thinking about the balance of your CX and your EX on a constant, constant fashion to make sure that you're really kind of suited for success and you're setting your team up for, for that optimal success. So all awesome points there. Yeah, no, and, and, and really critical. And I just like that, you know, you got to have some flexibility, you know, just because everybody has the same job description, because, you know, we're like a lot of companies, we don't have a unique job description for every single human that's in here. 
you know, yeah. we've got people who are at a director level that are sitting in a certain team. And so they're expected to be relatively similar, but you want to leave space for people to be able to flex and be able to really re re leverage their particular strengths because you get great contributions to the organization that way. And when people have some ownership in what they do, right, we don't like being most of us don't want to be treated like little robots where we get told this is all you do and this is what you do and this is how you do it. Most of us don't love that. That doesn't lead to long-term success. And there's something really wrong if you care more about your customers than you care about your employees. Yeah, I very much agree. And and then, and yeah. then the other part too is just the that uh, empowerment that you're talking about. It leads to that confidence. It leads to that ability to perform at a really high level. It leads to that ability to just knowing that you can go into any situation and just kind of make it work. You're going to make it work for your customers. You're going to make it work for your team. You're going to make it work for your business. It's, it's such it's all excellent points here. Yeah, absolutely. Team Lisa, Mary, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to kind of pick your brain in terms of the, the second CX pillar of tools. So you guys work with a bunch of different companies and you work with uh, across a number of different industries. You and your team must see a, a whole bunch of different types of technology sets and a whole bunch of different tools that companies are really kind of using to think about not just their customer experience, but, their day-to-day -day business operations and keeping the train on the tracks and making sure that all of these different things that we're talking about, different teams, different departments, different subject matter experts coming from different parts of the company are kind of on the same page. I'd love to hear you uh, take a couple of minutes to kind of talk about some of the things that you've learned in your journey about, about tools and some of the ways that, you, that are, are, you can give our listeners ideas for how they should be thinking about tools as they grow and scale their businesses and teams. Yeah, absolutely. I think I want to start with something. We were talking about this yesterday because we're in a period right now where we are looking at a broad array of stuff and oh my gosh, every day I feel like the list changes. And we've this year, <laughs> <laughs> we have got a dedicated team because this has become such a big thing. And there's so much of it out there that we've got a dedicated team now whose responsibility is to constantly look how we're operating and look and awesome. see if there are tools and technology that we need to add to make us better. So while we were having this conversation yesterday, <laughs> one of the things that came up is we have to continue to remember tools don't do the thinking for us. Mm -hmm. There's still room for humans to be thinking. And I, and I think it really resonated with me because I was like, you know what? We sometimes are looking for tools that are going to somehow take that off our plates. Yeah. When I think what we're really, really looking for is tools that allow us to do more of that. The actual thinking, the thing that the tools and the tech and the algorithms you can't really do as well as we can. There's still no substitute for what the human brain and the fact that, again, if you're paying attention to your customers and your employees, you've got far more information than a tech tool is ever yep. going to have. So yep. I think it's looking at these tech tools in terms of how do they free you up to do the thing that really humans can do best and look for tools that give you that space and take give you back that portion of your plate, if you will, for you to do that critical work. And that's really what we, that's the approach that we take. What we try to do is look at the things that lend themselves readily to automation, that lend themselves to tech support, that give us, uh, you know, help us 50% of the way, knowing that we're going to take it the rest. We're going to use, you know, good old fashioned brain power to get it the rest of the way there instead, you know, because yeah, it still yeah. works. There's nothing broke there. It definitely does. It a hundred percent does. You're absolutely right. So it's how do you balance that? Because what we, what I do see across a lot of my clients and, and I've seen us do it here at Engine 2, um, although we're really good at being self-aware about it. So I, I, it's not gotten us in any kind of big trouble, but is understanding the place. What role and where is the place for tech? I've seen some companies that, wow, they lean way too heavily into it and they get way too yeah. dependent on it. And then when it doesn't work or they don't understand it, things start to quickly fall apart, um, you know, or they don't leverage it enough. And, you know, that's probably the biggest thing we hear too, is we'll get people coming to us going, we've got scads of data sitting around. We probably have the secrets to the universe sitting in the corner over there. Yeah. And we have no way to tap into it. We have no way yep. to touch it. We know it's there. We, we don't have the tools to be able to deal with it. And so it's like, you know, yep, it's an investment sometimes. It is, but you got to think about the long-term return you're going to get on that. And it isn't necessarily going to be easy to calculate a dollar return. It's just, it may make you smarter. It frees up more time. It allows you to do the things that, that really only humans can do. And that's kind of my big, my point. And whenever I'm looking at different tech tools out there, whether it be how to help us understand project flows and resourcing, like staying on top of where things are at or whether it's how we're handling unstructured data is realizing none of it is going to be a substitute for human thinking. Yep. And it should be intended 
to help make things easier to give you more time to do that because that's really where the value lies at least in my industry I, I i love it a couple points that you laid out that i just think are so or are, are, are just dynamite is that the first part is honestly I, at least Maria, I, I there's over the last couple of months i've had more guests on the show basically when we get to the tool section they say something along the lines of what you said which is like look man tools are great but like your team, the, the people that are around those tools, using those tools, managing those tools, supporting or not supporting those tools are literally the most important thing. And I think it's really important for people to hear that because I know we have a lot of folks that are listening yeah. right now that love technology. They love all these different SaaS applications that are out there, but Lisa Marie just nailed it. Like if you don't have the appropriate utilization, management and oversight, um, I, I want to go back to one of the first parts that you said in the first pillar team too, even just general cultural mission and like values and direction. Like, why are we here? What are we all here to do? What are we all like, what direction are we rowing the boat? Tool usage can be hard. I think one mm -hmm. of the, you know, it, with a lot of the customers that we're working with, um, one of the first things that we do inside of some of our CX boot camps or even inside of our accelerators, is we're constantly doing like these tool kit audits and tool kit assessments. And we're looking for things around mm. what are your usability rates or, are, you know, is this tool a high, a medium, a low? Oh, it's low. Interesting. Okay. But every, but a hundred of you CSMs have this tool. Okay. That's a red flag just because just from a pure dollars yep. and cents perspective. But then there's another piece, which is like on the customer experience, the customer success side of so many businesses if you start stacking up 10, 15, 20 tools yes. on your average customer success manager or customer experience manager, as good as he or she can be, it, can, it becomes really difficult to, to master all that context switch, switching. You need to know 20 different playbooks around 20 different SaaS applications. You already know that a third of them, you're probably not even opening on a weekly basis because you just don't need the damn things. The other, And then there's maybe two or three yep. tools that you know that you're spending 80% of your time. And it's like, it's, 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 it's up to us, customer-focused business leaders, to take the time to sniff that stuff out, understand where you're at in your business's case or in your team's case, and then have some big conversations and some difficult conversations across the different aisles of your business with other leaders around, hey, what really makes sense here? Like, how can we make sure that we're giving our employees the best possible toolkit that they can kill it with their ground game? And then more importantly, how are we making sure that those same tools are, are providing an excellent customer experience for all of our customers and our users. And it's funny because like yeah. a lot of people don't actually think about that, right? They're, they're, they, they want the tools no. that they want for their team or they want the tools that they're comfortable with that they've used in the past. And this is an awesome, awesome point, Lisa Marie, that you're bringing up is like, we should have more of these types of conversations on a regular basis at, at, at growth focus companies to make sure that we're actually using the appropriate toolkits that we need. Oh yeah. I mean, I see so many that are like, well, everybody else is using it. So we're going to adopt it too. And it's like, yep. but a tool that isn't properly leveraged is going to give you none of the return. Yep. None, none of what they're telling you this tool can do. If it's not being leveraged and it's not being used and it's not being used correctly, you won't get that done. So the yep. thing that drew you to the tool won't happen. So again, it comes back to the people. Yep. The tools don't magically make stuff happen all by themselves. Most of them don't. I've seen very few that just automatically on their own, you just can, CEO is just going to sit back, put his legs up and the tool is just going to take it from there. It doesn't work that <laughs> yeah, way. A hundred percent. It's like <laughs> constant work, constant dedication, constant commitment. And somebody on your team, I love that you uh, you mentioned at Engine, you guys literally have a team or a group of SMEs that do nothing but look on the horizon. I think that's huge. I know that like smaller companies, they might have a harder time doing that. Oftentimes managers, directors, VPs are kind of stuck doing the day-to-day, -day, you know, battle leading, plus they're doing some of the horizon looking, but like when you can get to the point where you're able to kind of have a group of people that understand your internal and external use cases and they can do some of that, yes. um, that technology assessment for you, man, that's the way to do it. Cause frankly, that is a full-time job. That's a complete full-time job, it, understanding all these tools, absolutely. mastering them, knowing which ones are going to work. That's a huge part of, of, of understanding how to expand your, your, your tech kit. Yeah. Well, and especially, I think the last thing I'd say on that is that we didn't have that kind of full-time commitment till recently. And so before we just had a culture where we all kind of kept our eyes out, but we all talked to each other about those use cases and we we vetted things. We didn't, we didn't have a culture that allowed one person to run off and go sign up for this and somebody else can run off and go sign up for that. Like we weren't doing that. And, and the good thing about that is it meant we came together to have these conversations so that some person can say, well, here's the use case and this is where I think it's useful. And then we would gather teams, which means it became your part-time job for a moment because you get assigned to, hey, you, you, and you go off and vet this yep. one and then come back to us and talk to it about it. So now we've got, like say, a more 
you know, hey, you couple people, this is going to be predominantly your gig. But we're, they're still also coming back to the rest of us and checking those use cases and things too, so that we've got enough of us who see the business from multiple perspectives to be able to weigh in and say, yep, we most of us think this will be useful. Let's give it a whirl. I love it. You don't have it happening in isolation either, which there's a better chance that you'll make a mistake. Totally agree. Yeah, I love that idea of like having like a um, a, 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 a highly diverse team of, 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 of team members that are looking at this thing from a bunch of different angles to make sure that you're really getting something that the, the business, the company, the, the customer portfolio is going to really need in the future. Um, Lisa Marie, I'd love to dive into the third six pillar of process. And I'm excited about this one because I think there's a couple of different ways that you can, you can kind of slice and dice this, but I'd love to understand, you know, throughout your career, throughout your own personal customer focused business leader journey, um, what are some of the things that you've seen companies do or teams do extremely well when it comes to managing their processes, documenting their processes, certainly sharing or socializing their processes just to make sure that everybody kind of knows sort of what the what the marching beat is or what the what the expectations are. I'd love to I'd love for you to spend a couple of minutes talking about process. Sure. sure. Um, that's funny because that's been coming up a lot in my new role too. And in fact, even here at Engine Insights, we've now stood up a team for that too. Um, nice. We've got a business optimization group. Um, that's constantly looking at how we operate. And then obviously that connects to like the tools. So we've got these yep. people that show up when we're vetting things. Um, historically, you know, I think the people that do it right is you, you have to have process that's almost got rubbery guard, guardrails on it. You want to be able to flex and bend. I think when there's problems can stem from over process. I see some companies that there's a risk where you can, try to use process to solve things that are actually skill sets or people in the wrong job. So back to the first thing I was talking about, a lot of people, when you don't have the right people in the right place, or you just aren't giving them the ability to kind of lean into their strengths and kind of back away from their weaknesses, um, you'll, there's a tendency to want to use process to solve for that. And, and that, that doesn't work. You can't process your way out of having a skill set issue. Yep. or a bad bad fit issue. You just can't. And I think a lot of companies will try to do that first. On the converse, on that flip side of it, is not having any process at all and being a little bit too disorganized. And you know, you let this group does it that way and these people over there do it their way. And I think it's done with an, an intent to, you know, let's just let the people do it how they want to do it. And it's like, I'm a fan of that to a point, but there needs to be consistency, right? Agree, yeah. Again, thinking about the end client, when you're delivering, you don't want client A to be getting something radically different than client B, right? It's hard to go to market when you're like, who knows what you'll get? This is what we do, but hey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? I totally agree. Yeah, which variation today? Yeah. <laughs> it depends on who you draw out of the lucky magic hat as to what you're going to end up with. <laughs> and, I know. And especially, especially when you're trying to grow a business, right? Sometimes right. your ability to be consistent or your ability to remain um, as consistent as possible, that typically is what kind of fuels your growth. It fuels the fire. It fuels yeah. the ability to create a bigger army of promoters instead of like the variation stuff is what keeps businesses typically to be being a little bit smaller, right? You've got some people right. think that you're the, the, the best thing that's ever happened. Some people think that there, it wasn't that great. And the consistency piece is huge. It fuels that growth. It fuels that retention. And it really kind of, frankly, it's, it makes for a bit more uh, fun of a workplace to be perfectly frank is when you're, when you're working at a company that has a consistent product, a consistent service, you're all on the same deliverable page. results. Everyone's on the same page. It's just a, a, a better place to be a part of. It just absolutely is. And so like I say, I love, I love to get process to get us 80, 90% of the way, and then leave some room for that creativity or our ability to bend and flex because you did get stuff thrown at you that you didn't yeah. see coming and you went, oh, we didn't build the process for that. So we're going to need to bend it a bit, yeah. um, you know, but continually bending it till you break it all the time. Like that can't be the mentality either. I've worked in environments where there's clear process and the culture seems to be yes, but we just break it every time we, we get the moment to do so. And I'm like, so you might as well not have it then, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, right. You might as well not be there. <laughs> so and what's only, the point? And not only that, that, that can be uh, from, 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 from just personal experiences that, accepting of just constantly breaking things over time that's typically that hurts the, the employee experience that hurts employee morale that hurts, hurts the employee yep that, it's and it's inefficient not, you lose money that way too 100 percent. and so you know for those that love to watch that bottom line number that on its own should be a reason is that you lack that efficiency that you get by really honing the engine and honing the machine right 
Yeah. You, yep. you just so now you're paying a ton of money to produce something that's of questionable value. Like you say, it may be great over here on Tuesday yep. and over there it's you know barely getting a passing grade on Friday. You know, so and and let's face it again, kind of going back to the human element. Nobody, I don't care if it's when you're sitting at home shopping on Amazon or in your role as the head of CX for a company, you don't want to buy something that you don't know what you're going to get. Yep. It shouldn't be. And most of us don't buy mystery boxes on a routine basis. <laughs> no, that'd be an interesting business right there. <laughs> Wouldn't it? <laughs> mystery <laughs> box. Mystery box of the week. I like that. <laughs> um, no, it's so true. So I, 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 a couple a couple thoughts for the listeners on this part is just like really good point. There is, there's a balance, right? You don't want to be too draconian because that can be not a fun place to be. And also then you're not, you don't, you're not providing that, that pliability because things will inevitably hit the fan. That It happens in every business, in Always. every team, in every part of the globe. And then number two, there's something that allows the flexibility also allows room for creativity, right? And if you've got awesome A players on your team that want to be creative, they want to come up with different ideas, they want to be innovative, they want to be like able to have a little bit of flex in their game, right? Because they're, they're hearing these right. things every single day. It allows for that too. So awesome points there, Lisa Marie. Um, I'd love to dive into the, the fourth and the final CX pillar of feedback. So um, I was excited to dive into this one. I, I find that as I've done more and more and more of these episodes, this one's always interesting me because people always have very different answers and they've got different <laughs> focus points. And some people love feedback. Some people hate feedback. Some people have really, really, um, really stark opinions about the ways to collect that feedback and the ways not to. But I'd love, for you, I'd love to hear your version of it. I'd love to hear kind of how you think about customer and employee feedback, what's worked well, what have you seen some companies do a dynamite job with, what are, what have you seen some companies not do a great job when it comes to feedback? Yeah, I I got to admit, I got I to gotta start with a little quote that my manager says to me all the time, and I've known him for years, a problem half, a problem half solved is a problem identified. Yep. And I, you know, I, I'm not sure he made it up, but he loves to espouse <laughs> it. And yeah, yeah, right, right. I think it came out of sports somewhere, truth be told. Probably. But, um, <laughs> that'd be his thing. But um, it, it's really true. And you can't identify it if you're not talking to each other, whether that be to your customers or whether that be to the folks that you're working with under your own roof. You can't identify a problem if everybody's sitting silent. So yeah. there has to be feedback loops. And that feedback is also what propels you forward and it makes you better. In fact, one of the things I lead around here is there isn't anything that goes to our clients without, okay, I'm going to step that back a second. We send emails without group review, but like any big deliverables, we don't send those to clients without a group review, without getting a group of people to look at something because we all have a slightly different perspective. And, you know, you don't want to put something that important all in one person's basket. That's a lot of stress. And yep. so we give each other feedback in real time. There is no, I'm going to just send you a note on what I don't like. It's a open conversation. It's a nope. You don't just get to pass me a note. You're going to get on the phone. We're going to talk about this, but in a safe way, you know, not in a threatening, not in a, wow, how'd you get that wrong kind of a way, but in a way that says, you know what, that's a good point. How do we make it better? Yeah. Or let's talk this out because I read one thing, you read another, and this third person over there saw something even slightly different, which is great. Then let's talk it through. And, you know, then when it comes to our customers, you know, again, that open door policy. How'd you feel about that? What'd you think? We've got multiple touch points where we want to talk to our clients. Everything from the person that deals day to day all the way up to our CEO and then a formalized CX feedback system. We want to know. And what I've noticed, and this is not only in our experience, but even as we run CX programs for our, for our customers, it's funny how few people don't want to give that feedback. Yep. How many people just don't give the feedback? They just kind of move on. And, um, you know, so getting creative and thinking about different ways to get that feedback, making it easy for people to do it, because let's face it, again, on the human front, none of us likes to spend all day doing stuff that's ridiculously hard when you don't think it needs to be. 100%. So make it easy. Just yep. make it easy. Nobody wants to sign up for an extra 15 minute job to yep. give you feedback. Um, so make it easy and, and, but try to get that feedback whenever you can. And I think companies that do that tend to do a better job of staying in touch with their clients and knowing how to talk to them. I think one thing that needs to happen in this industry too, is how do you have those conversations? Talk to people like they're humans and quit giving them things that look like a sixth grade quiz like, I think where the survey world needs to change a bit is let's talk to each other in language that we actually use. I'm sure you've seen the same thing. 
a lot of CX feedback mechanisms are still using the same language and same questions that we used like 20, 25 years ago. Yep. I don't know if anybody's poked their head up lately, but we don't, it, things are different. Yeah. You know, we don't necessarily talk the same way. We don't necessarily think about things in the same way. And, you know, I think that as a lot of things have shifted to a much more casual, more, you know, relationship-based communication, that's our, our research likely needs to go the same way. Our CX programs probably need to be the same way where they need to be more human centric instead of so researchy. Yeah. Yep. And we would probably get better feedback and we get people conversing with us instead of these kind of static, awkward questions. hundred percent. I mean, I think you just nailed it, Lisa Marie. It's like, on one hand, it's like, be different, be unique, be interesting, right? Like you be real and be human be real. You're dealing with humans. And then I think the other thing that I'm constantly thinking about, and I love your answer here, but like what you just made me think about also just make sure that you're touching these different customers on the right medium. Like if you've got oh, uh, yeah. a, a customer group, that's totally down with picking up the phone and chatting for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And you can theoretically, not only can you have an awesome conversation with the customer, get a bunch of good information, have a nice little touch point, sort of probably learn a bunch of different things on both sides, right? Frankly, and then it's yeah. a kind of an enjoyable conversation for the day. And then number two, like play to the, play to what the, what the expectations are around it, where some people are fine with the survey email and that's fine for them and they're okay with it. Do that. If people are down right. with the, the Zoom chat and jumping out or better yet, a focus group and like, they're, they're, they're totally down to give you information to, to at least from Reese's point. They don't want to sit there and do a 15 minute survey, but they will jump onto a, maybe a 30 minute mm-hmm. Zoom call where they get to talk to 10 other SMEs from other industry, like other industries, other businesses. Maybe Absolutely. they pick up some ideas along the way. Plus they give their two cents for the product, the service, the will you're aware that you're trying to get information. I'm like, there's not enough companies that are doing creative stuff like this with their CX and their CS. And I think that you're right. Like post pandemic, especially with what the, what, what the whole DM world's gone through for the last two years, be personalized, be creative and make it fun, make it fun and make it interesting, right? Make it, make it interesting to give that feedback to a brand. hundred percent, hundred percent. Just rethink how you connect with people, both in terms of what you say, how you frame the conversation, where you have the conversation, you know, again, thinking about how you are, there are certain conversations that you have in your home. There's certain conversations you'll have out over dinner. There's other conversations you'll have at a party. Yep. You know, just think about that context and that appropriate place and time and, and the tone of the conversations and things like that. And then make it easy. If, if your base is sitting on Instagram, figure out a way to get the feedback that way. Yep. It's easy enough to do. You can literally get feedback anywhere these days. hundred percent. Yep. Lisa Marie, this has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Before we wrap up today's episode, I want to make sure where can people find out more about you and where can they get in touch with you? And then where can people find out more about Engine Insights and all the awesome things that you and your team are doing today? Oh my gosh. Well, Engine Insights, we are all over LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as well. So if you want to find me there, you can do that. Um, You can also reach out to Engine Insights and they'll be able to track me down there too. Um, And Engine has websites. So if you just go to, oh my gosh, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it's Engine global.com i can't remember i have a bookmark how bad is that <laughs> it's it's totally fine I, I i i first of all we'll share it in the notes but second of all um you, you spot on people can find you on linkedin they can find engine insights online and then we'll make sure at least Marie, that we add that to all of our, our show notes as well yeah absolutely and i believe uh they've they've also got an instagram following and a twitter and the whole nine yards you know they're a marketing agency we are we are everywhere our customers are you know same thing how, it's the way you got to be this day and age. I love you it. Well, Lisa Marie, thank you so much for, for coming on the show, sharing your story, sharing your journey, sharing all the awesome things that you and the team at Engine are working on. It's been our absolute pleasure. Oh, same here. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.